Hi folks, Lucy Riley here with Ballots for Burning. Thank you so much for um, coming in to uh, Addie's Living Room Eight with minutes. Jim Soper. About uh, our upcoming conference and also about his work over the last decade with the Voters' Rights Task Force here in California. We have a conference coming up October 7th through 9th in Richmond, California. Um, stay tuned. We'll be getting you uh, more details about that as we're going moving forward. But lots of great speakers, lots of great topics. And our focus is to clean up our elections process here in the state of California. And we would like to get some history from Jim on the Voters' Rights Task Force, um, the work that he's been doing over the last 10 years. And Jim, take it away, dear. Hi, uh, I'm Jim. I think we'll start out, first of all, what's going on now in Sacramento. There was a bill, there has been a bill, AB 1921, that passed the Assembly, just passed the Senate, and is on the way to the governor's desk. In a few words, it would let anybody bring in literally truckloads of ballots, vote by mail ballots, and deliver them to the election office and say, here, count them. No questions asked, no records kept. Current law says you can only bring in ballots for family or household members. They're taking that away. Uh, we fought that uh, in the, well, we, we first fought it in the Assembly and the Elections Committee, and it passed. The Democratic Party wants to increase turnout, and they, they see anything that helps vote by mail increases turnout, which helps the party. So they're pushing for this. But we just see a lot of problems with potentially people buy, buying votes or your boss telling you how to vote, uh, or there's something called granny farming where they go into senior centers and help seniors to vote. And there's another one that people aren't aware of yet, but a couple of us can put together. It's called automated forgery, which is there are companies that get hired by the counties mm -hmm. to send out the vote by mail ballots. Well, they have the ballots, they have the envelopes, they have the addresses, They've got the signatures that go in the envelope. And if you combine that with what's going on now, get out the vote campaigns, they can find out who's not voting. Put it all together and you can go and vote for people. And this is something that is going to happen if it's not already happening and we need to make people aware of that. We'll talk more about that at the conference. We need to have some kind of control on who can bring in how many ballots. It looks like the legislature is going to pass this bill. Uh, we're trying to, if you go to the Ballots for Bernie website, you'll see postings to please contact the governor and tell him to veto it. He's been known to think for himself and make his own choices. And maybe he'll say, no, we don't want this. If not, there's going to be things that we're going to be bringing up uh, at the conference, there's going to be hearings next year about new regulations for vote by mail processes and provisional processes. Mm -hmm. And this is part of what we're going to have the hearing about. We're going to have to get organized to go in and give input to the Secretary of State of here are your problems, you need to have regulations for that. And that's something I'm looking forward to working with all the ballots for Bernie people about lobbying. Sacramento to get that cleaned up. And this is an opportunity that I just learned about this past week. How exciting, Jim. So what we're talking about is being able to organize hundreds, if not thousands, of our ballot count monitors that helped us out with the post-election ballot count monitoring initiative through Ballots for Bernie and our um, cousins down in SoCal who've been working with Lauren Steiner um, we have an opportunity to organize these folks as activists to yeah. help us clean up our elections process here in the state of California. We can mobilize on buses just like we did when we went to Nevada and, no, Nevada and knocked on doors and for Bernie. And we can get these folks up to Sacramento um, lobbying um, our congressman. Yeah. In Sacramento, in, in your county, mm -hmm. it's always a place to be working for cleaner elections. That's how 
the Voting Rights Task Force, that was one of our first big tasks. Uh, task Force got started in the, right after the 2004 election. Don Goldmarker said, we have to do something. And their first action was to get Senator Boxer to win the election which was brought before the House of Representatives for approval in January of 2005. A representative from Ohio got up and said, no, I have a problem with this. Mm -hmm. And they needed one senator to stand up and say, I have a problem with it too. We need to look at this. And they literally flooded Boxer's emails, her phone, fax, to just all kinds of people and said, you got to stand up and object. And she did. Mm -hmm. And they started off on the right foot. Then they held a, a teach-in in February, which is the precursor to what we're going to do this October. And they had great people in there, and that's when I started to become really aware of what could be done uh, and who the people were out there that were looking at this. Then we went to the counties, because the issue there was the Alameda County, which is Oakland, Berkeley, was going to buy new election systems, new voting systems. And they had Diebold, and we were hearing enough about Diebold, so you don't want to do Diebold. Uh, we had two massive hearings with the TV there and national experts getting up and saying, no, don't do this. Look at alternatives, etc." Well, the supervisors went ahead and bought the systems. But part of what I've learned over the years is about a third of what we achieve is luck. But you've got to be playing the game to be lucky. If you're not in it, you're not going to get lucky. Well... In this case, the conservative supervisor put out a proposal. Well, how about in the November election? We can't count all of the votes on the paper trail, the voter verified paper audit trail. We're going to hand count all of them. Well, what happened is the registrar said, if you've seen these, they're, they're like toilet paper rolls or adding right, machine rolls. The machine. And that they're, they're yeah. just, you got to cut them up. Hand counting them is, would really be hard. So the registrar said, I don't want to hand count those. I'm going to shove those voting machines, the touchscreen machines, into the corner. And we're going to use paper ballots that we can scan. Regular paper ballots. Mm -hmm. And what happened is that was the election that Deborah Bowen got elected in. And the next August, I, she must have paid attention to that because in her regulations for the new machine, she held her top down to uh, top to bottom review. And it, of course, said these machines are hackable. Well, people are realizing it now, 10 years later. But it's being repeated, what we've already known. And she put in regulations that said, you're going to hand count all of the vote, VPAT votes, all the paper trail votes. You're going to hand count them. Mm -hmm. And so all the registrars did the same thing. They shoved the machine in the corner. L.A. County is different, but L.A. is always the exception. Uh, and since then... 90% of Californians are voting on paper ballots, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is exceptional for the country. And the basis on which we can have some way to help improve the system, we can potentially recount. And what happens if we don't recount them enough, mm -hmm. but at least we have something we can recount. Louisiana is considering having people vote on iPads. The state will buy iPads for all the counties. Wow. And there will be no paper trail. In it's 2016, frightening business. It's frightening business. It's frightening they can business. fit over the, with the, uh, the electronics, and there's no way to count them. So California at least got started in that track direction, the VRTF. One of the other things, we did many different things in different venues. One was a huge statewide effort to get Deborah Bowen elected as wow. Secretary of State. Talk a little bit about that for our folks that, that are watching and tuning in on the live stream who may not know who Deborah Bowen is. Deborah Bowen is the former Secretary of State from 2007 to a year ago, two years ago. Uh, she did eight years. She's very bright and she had uh, has a lot of integrity. And she came in and she knew these machines were hackable and she says, I'm going to run it top the bottom of you conducted by computer scientists from the University of California. Mm -hmm. uh, they did, and they said the machines are hackable. And then she proceeded to write for Sequoia 40 regulations 
about how you're going to handle those machines. Mm -hmm. She wrote them herself along with her, her top assistant, Lowell Finley. She wrote them herself. And they're very good. And she listened to the technical people, and there's things in there. I'm not going to go into explaining here, but you got to be technical to know how viruses are propagated to know why she's got three tabulators so that the virus doesn't continue to get repropagated throughout the system. She put that in there. She was the best Secretary of State this, secretary, this country's ever seen. Set the standard. Yeah. She set the standard. And so she came in and, and did that, and then there were numerous fights. I wrote, I have a web page called countediscast.org. Every vote should be counted as cast.org. There's one on Internet voting, and there's one page that said, Thank you, Deborah Bowen. And it goes into numerous things where she helped activists and helped immensely in the fight against Internet voting that people don't know about because it happened off on the side. People don't see that. It doesn't make the headlines. But it was critically important. So getting her elected was really helpful. One of the things we did, we learned in that process that the state democratic convention where they nominate uh, or endorse the candidates, we focused on that. We, the democratic party had their own person, a woman who was also running, who didn't know nearly as much. And so the activists from all over California came to that convention for two, three days, and we flooded it with flyers and talked with people about why you got to vote for Deborah Bowen. She got 81% of the delegates to endorse her, which is wow. unheard of. Yeah, that's amazing. That's and that's where you find out where you need to put your time and attention, focus on that. Mm -hmm. Where are the centers of power? Where are the, where are the decisions makers? Mm -hmm. and, and go work with them. And in this case, for that election, that was the big hurdle to get her the endorsement out of the party. And that's some very interesting um, history for us to um, envelop into our formula going forward. That there is such a thing as an activist Secretary of State that can work with the voters, with the electorate, mm -hmm. and pushed in the right direction, can work towards voter um, election, work towards election integrity for us all. Um, and I'd, I'd like for you to talk about, um, for just a moment, just how few people were originally working with Deborah Bowen to get her moving in this direction. Because I want our folks that are, um, that are um, coming in on the live stream to understand that this really does not take an army of people. This takes a group of committed folks working together, following a formula, and holding our public officials um, uh, accountable. Back in 2006, I think the Voting Rights Task Force had about uh, 20 people. <laughs> 20 people. And there were people scattered all over the state, all over California. We had maybe 100 mm -hmm. for the whole state. And was that push, plus a couple of the people talk, met Senator Bowen early on and identified her as the per person we should back. So they picked out somebody early, and then said, so we're going to back her, and then started a long process to, to get her name out there. We were passing out flyers at the BART stations, at conventions, all over the place to get her name out. And a hundred some odd people were working closely with Deborah Bowen to yeah. get her elected, yeah. working closely with the um, Secretary of State candidate at the time. Yeah. And so, of course, she was willing to work with these folks that had helped to get we her We made the elected. campaign video for her. Mm -hmm. She had some snapshots, but they needed to put something together that would run 15 minutes. We did that, yeah. and they needed that, and that was uh, help for the fundraisers. Yeah. So that, I'm, I'm proud of, that's the best thing we've done, is get her elected. Mm -hmm. uh, is, and that took focused effort and a lot of effort, and it paid off. It paid off. Uh, Talk to us a little bit more, um, Jim, about some of the... Um, of the um, landmark um, uh, actions that the Voters' Rights Task Force has worked on over the years um, that have really um, sort of been the unsung gems um, and what's been going on behind the scenes with what you guys have been working on. 
Um, I am hoping that our folks that, uh, that are chiming in on the live stream will get a better idea of the, um, of the, of the depth of the work that um, the Voters' Rights Task Force, Force has been doing and that, you know, um, we'll, we'll be able to enroll you uh, in this process with us moving forward. Well, as I said before, we want to think about who to talk to, who, who are the decision makers. We want to go work in areas where we can get some success. So the landscape changes at one point early on with Alameda County that was buying voting systems, and there was a fight in San Francisco. And then there was a moment about 2007 when there was legislation in, in Washington going on. Uh, we shifted our attention because that had the possibility, it was called the Hope Bill, and that had the possibility of uh, saying everybody's going to use paper ballots and you're going to audit them. And it barely lost. But we, that was the moment when we had a shot at it. And so changed the focus there. In Sacramento from 2008 to a couple years ago was just, it is a mess. It always is a mess, but they had a huge budget problem. And they weren't going to spend any money for anything. So we didn't spend a lot of time up there. That's changed. And now it's a place that we've been putting a lot of attention in. That's down to just four of us. Going up to Sacramento and figuring out a, an agenda of what we want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, going up with a couple of proposals, pick out the most important things to do that are achievable and then figure out who's on the election committees, who are the decision makers, and go talk to them. And two things happened. One, in 2013, a colleague in Riverside County, again, luck. Uh, he wanted to get the information, there's what's called detailed precinct reports. Each system puts an electronic card, how many votes, that system counted for each candidate, and it goes to the central committee, central tabulator, which has a database, and lists all of this information. And we said, well, it's sitting in the computer. Let's get it on the Internet. Well, he went to talk to his brand-new Republican assembly uh, lady, Melissa Melendez. Well, he talked to her chief of staff, and he was the campaign manager. And guess what? That person was a campaign manager, and he wanted that information on election night. And bingo, we got a bill introduced. Wow. Just like that. A little bit of luck. you got to find the right person, but you go out there and you talk to all kinds of people, and you find the right person. We got a bill introduced. And we went up there and supported it. Uh, we got ABA 13 passed with zero opposition, none, because it was a Republican introducing it, and the we were supporting it, and Democrats were for it. We had no, zero votes against. Now, it's not election night. It's 30 days after the election, so we, I'd like to get a group together to go make sure the counties are complying with this. They have to do it if their systems allow them to it. If the system doesn't allow them to it, well, then let's be reasonable, no. But in the future, we're going to want systems that let you get that data up. And we said, okay, we got 30 days afterwards. Let's go for election night. And we worked hard on this. Richard Tim and I went up to Sacramento along with Carl. And Richard had done a lot of campaigning for Tony, Tony Thurman. And Tony introduced a bill for us this, fall, this spring in February. AB 2824. And so this is our second bill. And we lobbied for it, and that one got a little more attention, and the registrars wound up stalling it. And we're going to have to go back. In the process, Sacramento is, does things in, in phases. Right now, the legislature, both floors, are considering over 1,000 bills in the month of August. There was one point several years ago when the Assembly Appropriations Committee had to deal with 400 bills in one day. Yeah. This is insane. But 
it's finding out how this works and what the rules are that helps you work with this. In this case, we got through the Assembly Elections Committee and it went to appropriations and appropriations gets to consider it if it's going to cost the state some money. Um, at the first hearing, they said, well, it might cost some money. And they, they tabled it, they pushed it off. And then the re registrar said, we don't like this. In their letter, they, they said things that just simply were not true. And we wound up being placed under, I think it's called suspension, which means you ran out of time. We think it's negotiable, but you ran out of time. Because this has to be on the floor by June. Death we, by insidious demise. Right. <laughs> so we ran out of time, but we know where we're at. And we're, gonna, we're going to go back right. and keep at it. Because that's an important step is to get information up, available to the public as much as possible, as fast as possible. Jim, let's talk about a big success that we just had recently with um, shutting down um, Internet voting. Ah. We've had, the Voting Rights Task Force has fought against four bills to introduce Internet voting into California since 2009. And understand, internet voting, I'm sure a lot of people hear you listening to me, hearing me over the internet. This is great. Let's vote on our phones. Uh-uh. Because -uh. it's just too hackable. And there's no paper trail to follow. So we understood this 10 years ago. But there are people that keep on introducing bills to introduce internet voting in the state of California. Voting Rights Task Force has gone and for three of the hearings, three of the bills, we were the only people to show up from the public to say no. We were the only ones there. The, there was one that was going to really do pilot projects and they got about 20 people to show up. Fortunately, and this was a critical piece, the Secretary of State in all four cases opposed it. The other thing that you were referring to is in January, there were three initiatives, ballot initiatives, that were clearing the Attorney General's office. The Attorney General has to prove a title for the initiative and a description. And three initiatives would have forced California to go to Internet voting. Uh, at the conference, we will have some experts come in and talk about this. This is the mother of all issues. If they introduce voting on your cell phone in California with no paper and all the hackability, it's game over. They can do whatever they want, especially the people running the system, but not just them. Uh, that the DNC got hacked. Right. And the security experts say this looks like it was Russians. All of a sudden, it dawns on people, oh, this stuff is not secure, and elections are important, and Russia may want to hack into elections. Uh, duh. Right. Duh. So this is going to be a big help. But we had to make this argument since 2009 and others even earlier. Well, Richard and I took uh, 1,200 flyers down at the Democratic Convention in San Jose, and we passed them out. 1,100 of them in an afternoon. It was an exhausting day. But we were reaching opinion leaders, members of elections committees, big donors, Kamala Harris. Uh, we were giving them, them this information. They never heard about it. Well, it turns out that one of the initiatives was poorly written by a gentleman named Martinez, and that wasn't going to go anywhere. He wasn't going to get funding from his own company because it was just sloppy. The other two were, were funded by the same billionaire, Silicon Valley billionaire. That was the frightening one. And uh, we understood we cannot wait to see if he gets on the ballot. And it was his software, right, that he wanted no, to No, push? no, no. He, he has a history Tell us of... Tell a little bit more about this guy. I don't want to name names uh -huh. uh, because he did back down. He has a history of thinking that the Internet can be a democratizing 
thing. And he's right. That it's we are insecure. It's insecure, yeah. but it can if get messages insecure, out. It problem. get messages out. Uh, the Bernie campaign lit, thrived off the internet. Is one example. There's a lot of places where it, it can make uh, make things better. Mm -hmm. And he's just taking this idea of it's a democratizing institution. Let's do our elections on it. Right. And big problem. Big problem because of the security issue. He, I don't think he was doing it for his own personal benefit. I think he was naive, and some people must have talked to him. And the other, I mean, I, I like to think that Richard Inouye handed a flyer out to the right person who talked to him, or was one of several people who talked to him. Uh, the other thing that happened in this case is that the Attorney General's office gets to write a description and they, they pass the question over to a financial office saying, how much is this going to cost? The figure came back and said, this is going to cost the state of California as much as $100 million. Fortunately, the venture was too expensive, so we were spared. What, what we wrote was, you know, if he wants to spend a hundred million dollars, he could spend his own money. Mm -hmm. Don't ask the taxpayers to to do this. Well, he didn't go out and get the signatures, mm -hmm. and so it looks like it's dead. Mm -hmm. They're going to be back. I guarantee you, they're going to be back. Not necessarily this one person, but there's several companies out there that stand to make money from this. Uh, democracy Live is one, Everyone Counts is another, uh, there's several others out there. They, they, they're, they do some very hard lo lobbying, they've been pushing in Toronto, and they're trying to get this done, and they're going to come back. We know it, so we have to be ready, and when it happens, drop everything else. And Jim, folks can find out about these organizations um, from your website? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, for folks that are um, chiming in and uh, joining us on the live stream, we would like you to um, add to bookmark countedascast.org. Um, we would love for you to join us with the Voters' Rights Task Force and follow um, live streams of our meetings. We want to invite everyone out to our um, Election Integrity Conference that's going to be happening in Richmond, California, City of Pride and Purpose, October 7th through 9th at Grace Lutheran Church. Folks, stick with us. We'll have more to come. Thank you so much. Governor Brown, contacting Governor Brown about even 1921. Uh, no, they should still contact him. There's some both things about this. Call him up. Or there's a page where you can write a little email. You don't have to write a doctoral thesis. We can find that on counterdiscast.org. Right? Well, no, that's not a, that's not quite that level. But there's enough words there that they, they can get some ideas. You don't want people to bring in truckloads of ballots with no questions asked and no records kept. That's all you need. And, and the, oh, the other point is, this bill was supposed to make it easier for people to vote, college students and sharing an apartment or something. Well, one, I call that a household, household, and the law already allows that. But two, they got stamps. They got postage stamps, put a stamp on the envelope and send it in. The bill doesn't do anything, but make it possible for parties, political acts to get organized and go out and, and collect ballots any which way they can. And you know, on the vote buying thing, the, one of the bills reiterated that uh, there's sections of this parts of this code that says uh, certain activities with ballots are illegal. Well, yeah, vote buying is illegal, but you got to catch it. <coughs> and somebody can bring in ballots, and there's no signature. His he doesn't sign in with his signature and his address, and there's no positive ID. You don't know who brought those things in. If later on you start to notice that hmm, it seems to be the same pen signing all these envelopes. The potential for forgery is just too great. Right, but how do you get them? Because there's no trail. Mm -hmm. So to say that vote buying is illegal doesn't mean much. Right. Um, the United States had 
massive vote buying in the late 1800s, and, and I'm sure in the 1900s. But the lever machines, the, those old time lever machines, they got instituted on the East Coast because the big party machines wanted to deal with somebody sitting in the bar, he gets one ballot, fills it out, and somebody comes in and says, here's your drink now, go in, get a ballot, and hand this one in, bring me back a blank. And they just were doing that all day in the United States. Um, the scenarios the, could go on at yeah, yeah. Well, they invented the lever machine to stop that. Mm -hmm. That's why that came into being. So vote buying is an American sport. <laughs> you don't get gold medals for it, but it's an American <laughs> sport. You may win elections with it, and we need to be aware of it, and we need to slow it down. Yeah, we're laughing to keep from crying, folks, because <laughs> this is the way our democracy is stolen. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do we have any other questions from the guests that are here tonight? Yes, I have a question. Can you tell us what we can do before November um, in the immediate future to help make the process uh, a little bit more honest? Welcome come to the conference. <laughs> Yay, come to our conference. To sign up to be a poll worker in your county. This is, they need them, they need young people who understand technology to go run these things. You will learn a lot about the real the reality of how elections are conducted, and this is the great place to get started. We're going to talk about that at our conference too, right? Absolutely. Right. We're going to train poll workers. We're going to talk about precinct monitors. Um, we're going to talk about um, uh, ballot count monitoring after the election. That's going to be a big one. Yeah. Go look at my web, web page. Go look at verifiedvoting.org. Go look at blackboxvoting.org. These are the three leading websites for information on, on election integrity. Okay. And so that would be a good place to start. It's a good question. If you're following us on Ballots for Bernie, we'll have all of these web pages and this information up for you as well soon after the live stream. Okay. Any more questions, folks? Just that it's really clear that it's important right now, right, to get Governor Brown. Right now, and, Governor Brown. And say exactly what? That we should not allow people to deliver ballots of vote by mail ballots with no records kept and no questions asked. In other words, veto AB... He should veto... 1921. Veto 1921. Yeah, right. AB 1921. Okay. I think that deserves a group chant. Veto AB 1921. All right. Folks, thanks for tuning in, and we hope to see you back at our next Rights Task Force live stream meeting. Thanks so much. Okay.